comments and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and does not represent legal or accounting advice or counsel and should not be seen as such. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only, a conversation. We make no promises or assertions on how this information will impact your business, your personal life, or financial well-being. The information relayed does not imply endorsement or offer opposition to any specific organization, product, or services. Welcome to SHIFT. I'm your host, Lori Power, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for joining today, Jeffrey. I want to start the conversation for those who may not know you. If you can give us a little bit of background on yourself and your business, and then we'll get into the depths of what you do for business owners. Yeah, sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on uh, as a guest, Lori. Always, uh, always a pleasure to uh, interact with you. Um, so my name is Jeff Cullen. I come to what I currently do now from a uh, a sort of varied uh, career path. Originally uh, started in mechanical engineering and was a, a practicing consulting engineer for about a dozen years or so. And during that time, sort of started migrating towards the business side of the engineering world, uh, you know, within firms and uh, project management and then departmental management, which led me to the realization that uh, they don't teach you everything about business in engineering school. The, despite what they you know we always say engineers rule the world but there's some gaps and so that got me into uh, a desire to go and do my MBA which uh, I did part-time at the U of A here and then that led me to really make a major shift away from engineering into management consulting which I did for just about 20 years as sort of a uh solo and then in some partnerships and then solo again and then in conjunction with the business development bank and always focused on uh, private sector uh, companies. I, you know, I didn't really want to do government work, I did a bit of it, and it was just like not for me. So, so really a predominant focus on privately held small and medium enterprise, of which succession and transition became uh, kind of a specialization about 10 years ago, then I kind of got away from it. And then about two years ago, when I wanted to sort of refresh what I was doing, I got into uh, reconnected to the exit planning uh, uh, world and decided to narrow the focus. And then, and then really um, through that met some business brokers at Sunbelt, where I'm currently uh, about the last year and yeah, coming up on 18 months, uh, a broker with the Sunbelt Edmonton office here. Um, and so no longer consulting, but obviously still connected as part of the ecosystem to, uh, to the exit planning world. And, uh, you know, really understand that for us to be successful at the end of the process, there's all of the opportunities for owners to tap into the network of, of advisors um, along the way. And so that's why I've continued this exit planning network, YEG, um, which we're going to rename, I think, Business Exit uh, Advisors Network to be compatible with the folks down in Calgary, because we want to grow a bigger and bigger ecosystem of so, um, so yeah, that's kind of how I come to, to be here this morning. Tell me a little bit about Sunbelt and why you chose to join there as a broker. And what exactly does that mean? So Sunbelt Business Brokers um, is the oldest and largest business brokerage in the world, uh, which obviously lends it some credibility. We have over 300 offices, uh, we say globally, but I'd say it's 90% would be North America, but there's a, you know, a couple of regional offices in other parts of the world. Um, it's a little bit like a, like a Remax in that it is a global network of independent uh, offices. So Sunbelt Canada is an umbrella that has all the Canadian offices. Sunbelt, I guess USA would be the American uh, offices. And because we're the largest and, and oldest, it was started in 1979, and we are entirely focused on Main Street business brokerage. So we don't do real estate. We don't do, you know, we don't do M and A, which is a little bit higher on the on the on the value chart. I shouldn't say value, but just the size of transactions goes up. We really focus on on the small medium. You know, anything from a Main Street um, coffee shop, if it's profitable, to about twenty million in in revenue. So a pretty broad you know range. But again, kind of on that lower end. 
why I chose Sunbelt, honestly, uh, I didn't know much much about business brokerage. I, I met a couple of the uh, folks that are now part of my team, or I'm on their team, or we're a team, however you want to put it, and uh, started a dialogue. And when I looked into it, found that, you know, being uh, so well-established, great reputation, global reach, um, and, and honestly, lots of training and support, having been a solo guy, you know, for 20 years, it's, it's nice to, to have those resources to, uh, uh, rely upon and, and, um, you know, to be able to just go to people and, and have that sense of belonging. So that was really why I did it. Great reputation, big reach, and then just we're really just great people. Now you had said something about you being at the end and still wanting to keep contact with those at the beginning. So do you consider what you do kind of the final process to a succession plan because you're matching the purchaser with the seller? Is Am I reading that correctly? Having gone through the EPI, you know, uh, um, methodology, I would say that we're not, we're not the, the last step uh, we're close to the last step, but obviously there's, you know, a business owner have, there's more to it than just getting the check at close, if you're lucky enough to close, and then being on your way, right? There's an adjustment period, there's there's both within the business in terms of handoff and training, and, and then there's a personal adjustment period. So again, the more somebody's prepared at the beginning... And, and has that runway when we go through our process of actually finding a buyer and negotiating all of that, that transactional piece, the more success they're going to report, you know, a year down the road, uh, which of course is good for them. It's good for us because, you know, when people are unhappy with something, they look for a reason, you know, to, to blame, whether it be their advisors or us or, right. So the more satisfied, you know, we have of, in terms of their, their, where they wind up, the better it is. So I'd say we're close to the end, but there's obviously some follow on, you know, with an owner that um, probably we would do a little bit of, but then if they've got an advisor that is, that has taken them through, you know, would continue that relationship and, and help them find what's next. Right. Would you say primarily your role is working with the buyer of the business more so than the seller of the business? No, we, so we're intermediaries in, in, in Alberta, we don't co-broker. So it's not like a real estate deal where you have your realtor and then the other person has a realtor. We, we act as dual agents. And so the relationship actually starts with the seller. Uh, so the way we say it, the seller is our client and the buyer is our customer, right? So there's a lot of, of, relationship building with the seller of the business um, through the initial discussion and perhaps they're not ready you know so we we lots of people will refer us folks and we'll have a conversation an early discovery and you know based on what we see we'll often tell people you know I don't know what your expectations are in terms of timing or we don't really talk value usually at the front but general speaking you know and we may say, look, I think you need to go find somebody in the network um, to help, you know, get ready. Or depending on their circumstances, sometimes they don't have that runway. And it's like, look, I, I got to sell this business within the next 18 months. And, you know, I'll take what, you know, we'll, we'll sell it as is, where is. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll start that relationship. Once we've had time to learn about their business and, and there's a bunch of steps, then we'll put it on the market. And then we begin to look at buyers and then we'll work that side of the relationship as well. So, you know, only about 2% of the people that approach brokerage will actually buy at the end of the day. And part of that process is to, to eliminate the folks who are maybe not serious or they're not, you know, they don't have the, the capacity to actually own a business or even if they do, sometimes people will be like, I want to buy this, you know, $2 million business. And we might be like, well, Based on your experience as a business owner, which it may be minimal or in some cases zero, you know, we might direct them to something that's maybe more manageable for their, their skill level because we want people to succeed, right? If someone buys a smaller business, learns the ropes, and then five years from now, they can come back and say, I want to sell this one and, and now buy the $3 million manufacturing. Hey, that's that's great for everybody. But, uh, but a failure because they've bought the wrong business is not good for anybody. That's a staggering number on both sides, though. Yeah. 
staggering number. So you think about the number of businesses that are getting ready to sell. And I hear this more times than not when we're talking about succession planning. And of course, I take it from the employee benefit point of view, because that forms such a substantial value component sure. to the business. So I hear, well, somebody will buy it. Okay. <laughs> Now take that to the number you just said, and only 2% of those that approach you to buy a business will actually buy a business. Right. That's staggering. Who's going to buy it? And how do you match these people together? Well, buyers, so they come in, in a lot of flavors. Um, again, because we do more of the main street upwards, we have maybe a broader, um, uh, uh, set of, of potential buyers than with, let's say, an M&A firm, because M&A firms tend to do its transactions, you know, a business is buying another business. We'll do everything from someone that's buying themselves a job, and they may be, you know, a journeyman or, or somebody who is going to step in and, and do the thing. Like, for instance, one of my partners is selling a locksmith, you know, so we're looking for someone who's got a, a red seal uh, uh, locksmith. Uh, but maybe they're working for another company and now they want to become a business owner. So it's a, it's a really good fit for someone like that because they know the the doing side of it. And then they, you know, they're going to have to learn the the business side, which is not a, a small thing. Uh, as companies get bigger, then we would have a broader mix. It may be a competitor. It might be someone in their, in their, in their vertical, you know, that's looking to do integration. Uh, we do deal with some private equity folks, you know, as the markets get tighter, they begin to come down a little bit in what they're looking for. So a vast variety of potential types of buyers. And then obviously the relationship and how the process goes is different. If we have a super sophisticated buyer that comes in, they're going to look at the business with a different set of eyes. Um, we'll probably value it slightly differently if it's going to be a, a roll up, you know, and then they're looking at economies of scale. That is different than someone saying, I'm going to be coming in, stepping into the owner's shoes, you know, paying myself a similar salary, right? But I'm basically buying myself a job. Uh, you know, I think people want to grow it into something bigger, but the first five years might be you've bought yourself a job. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, Lord knows such a large number of people who are business owners that fall in that category. And, and, and that's great. Well, there's a bit of security in that too, and working for themselves yeah. and working for on their own time. You know, the the adage, uh, I eat what I hunt, you know. Exactly. That's right. Yep. When yep. I can imagine you see a lot of business owners on both sides of that coin that you just turn away and say, you know what, now is not the right time. Mm -hmm. What is a bit of a misnomer or a misunderstanding that business owners, when it comes to planning their exit or buying, are not fully conscious of when they when they start tire kicking? As a, as a seller, you mean, when they start to think? As a seller, let's take it from both sides. Of the okay. Table. Let's take it first from the seller's point of view. Right. And then that 2%, the, like the, not, the other 98% that are not right. yet ready. Let's take it from that point of view as well. Okay. So from the seller's perspective, um, I guess some of the common misconceptions would be, first of all, uh, and there's a number, but how long will it take to actually sell my business? Right. So we usually quote people and our, and our process is set up around, around about 18 months. So we'll say 12 to 18 months is very realistic. Every now and then someone thinks they come in and they'll be like, well, in three months I'll be out. And it just doesn't work that way. Like the number of, of well, the process takes time, first of all. And then the number of deals that, that actually fail to close is pretty high as well. So we'll often have to go through two or three cycles of finding a buyer, doing the dance, you know, introducing them. And then something doesn't happen and, and the deal falls apart. So 18 months, pretty reasonable expectation sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. The other big misconception is the value of the business. So everybody thinks their business is, is fantastic. Um, they get, you know, uh, input from lots of sources, could be their accountant, 
Um, sometimes they'll, they'll hire a evaluator who will value the business from a, there's a lot of ways to value a business. There's a lot of, of reasons why you would value it. And the values often come out very, very differently, right? So it's like the assessment of your property for, for the tax level, you know, the municipality tells you your house is worth, you know, $600,000. You get very excited. A realtor might come in and, and it could be higher, it could be lower, right? Because they're looking at different things. So they're often owners- the market, think, What the market will actually pay. And what the market price. at that particular time, right? So there's there's all of these elements. Uh, so they often think the business is worth a lot more than it is. And, and this is one of the misconceptions too, is even, um, so a lot of owners sometimes will be paying themselves a, a really decent uh, salary, right? So they think, hey, the next person's going to come in and, and obviously they're going to just step into my shoes and, you know, off they go. And, and when we look at it, one of the things we look at is, well, how, like how much of the business is you, because a buyer is going to come in and they're going to look at this and say, once I take you out of the equation, uh, and even though a lot of sellers, you know, swear, Oh, I'll stick around. And, and, you know, usually we constrain them and stay around for a while, it might be a couple of months, but, if they didn't want to go, they wouldn't be selling, right? They're not going to be doing all of that work. And so the buyer, a savvy buyer has to look at it and go, okay, what's going to happen, you know, when that person's gone? If 90% of the value is in that person's head and their relationships and, and yeah, okay, you might be paying yourself half a million dollars. I won't be able to replicate that. I need to to value it on the basis of the first five years being, you know, lean and hard and 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 risky, right? So, and again, if someone comes and lists with us and they've done none of that pre-work and they're in a, in a, they need to get out, it's problematic. So again, part of the value of the pre-work is, is look, you need to look at this from the perspective of a buyer, uh, an economic uh, 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 asset, right? The, the, the easier it is to take you out of the equation as an owner, the easier it's gonna be to sell for, for high value. And then the bonus, and again, as a SEPA, you know this, in that three to five years, by doing that, you're probably going to have a better performance as well. And so the net, you know, the net income or the bottom line or the, the seller's discretionary earnings, we use all these different factors, is going to be higher because you're performing it, you know, better in the first place. So you get that double bump of higher multiple and a higher, you know, number that's being multiplied. So, so those are the two big misconceptions. Timing, what's the value of my business? And I guess tied to that is how easy am I going to be to to replace, right? Because I think a lot of owners downplay just how much they are driving the business, right? And they they don't they don't recognize like how integral they are. They haven't done that that removal of themselves. So that would be on the seller side, and there's other factors as well. But I think those are the three big ones. Uh, on the buyer side, again, a sophisticated buyer who knows what they're doing is going to have a much less uh, a broad set of misconceptions. A first time buyer, sometimes they, they might think they can manage a business remotely, right? A small business. And they'll be like, well, you know, I don't really want to move to Edmonton or I want to buy this from Toronto or wherever. And, and surely the management team can run the thing. And it's like, well, we don't really have a management team. You know, there's employees. And I, I think that's not going to be realistic. That's part of it. Um, I think some people misconceive how easy it will get will be to get financing to buy the business, right? Um, so again, understanding that, and that's something that we help buyers with um, um, as part of our our service. If they need our help, sometimes they come in and they've got that all lined up. But often we'll we'll introduce them to potential sources of of financing and take them through that process. Um, yeah, I think those are on the buyer side. Those are the two biggest ones. And then probably the other one, I think this is more general in terms of why employees don't necessarily do transitions internally as well. It's some of the misconception about how much risk you're going to be carrying to become an owner, you know, whether you buy or just sort of step in through an ESOP or whatever. And I've had as a consultant, lots of employees who think, you know, because the owner will say, well, I talked to you know some of the team, and they're, they're they want to become owners, and it's great. And it's like, yeah, but have you told them about you know personal guarantees? And 
if there's a downturn, you know, who's who's going to the bank, you know, to make payroll, right? And well, and they don't people... they don't make it easy here in Canada. I mean, the no. ESOP is just not as brilliant as it is in the UK and in the United States. Right. Although uh, we, you know we have Robert, a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, you know Robert Welke. He was just telling yeah. me on Friday there's some new mechanism that's coming into place. I can't remember. We're, we're talking about it this afternoon, actually. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a mindset, right? It's an owner's mindset thing. So again, that's part of what we do with a buyer where we will we'll probe those questions and, and like, you know, why do you want to buy a business? You know, what what are you, are you trying, are you running away from being a, an unhappy employee to becoming a business owner? Because if that's the only reason you're doing it, um, I think it's not going to go well, you know, the way that you expect it. Right? You're not going to be less stressed and feeling less pressure by buying a business it's going to be completely the opposite right well and you made a good point earlier on when you said about buying a job am i buying a job and so what's the value of buying a job and you use that red seal locksmith mm -hmm. you have that red seal locksmith they may have particular contracts that are worth something to somebody to buy but right. at the end of the day, what their their value of their company is, is simply those contracts and that continuity of the security of the job. But the job itself right. really doesn't have a value other than the charge out rate. So am I going to be able to retire based on my book of contacts or contracts right. in place? And yeah. So the who's going to buy it is is so important, right? If you are if you are that red seal and you're the one who needs to do the job, then what value are you planning into your retirement mm -hmm. that that is truly a value of the business versus right. the value of what you are servicing? Absolutely. And again, this this goes back to the to the uh, Exit Planning Institute. What do they talk about? A uh, business of um... Oh, they have a term, right? Is it a, I can't remember now. now a lifestyle. Know. Is it a lifestyle? Is it a lifestyle business versus, and they have that other term. And again, yeah. that, that ties back to the three to five year thing, right? Because again, there's nothing wrong with, with if someone's ambitions are to basically pay themselves a salary with a little bit of an extra, keep it small. As long as they, act, as long as they, they work with their financial planner, to realize that, hey, I'm I'm not going to get a million dollars out of this business, you know. Uh, and if I need a million dollars, then I need to to build the business to be something bigger. Because then take the, the day, time to do it. Yeah, exactly. So it, it all comes down to to runway, which I think you know most of us are are. I think we we fall short, uh, and this is why EPI, you know, put up that annual stat every year, and it's like ninety percent say an exit plan is important, but ten percent have one, and it's like how do we how do we make that gap smaller uh, to get people to start thinking about these things three to five years ahead of time, or even longer? And your business isn't a lottery and shouldn't be treated as such. Your right. business is you for many many people a lifelong endeavor. You talked about your own background and, and how long you've been working with businesses. This is not a one and done. I'm going to just pick a number out of my hat and expect that's what I'm going to get from right. it. If if you've built a lifetime or you've built your business over a lifetime, then take the time to get the value out of that business when you sell. And this brings me back to the seller or sorry, the buyer side of the of the coin. Mm -hmm. So interesting for my line of business, being an employee group benefit specialist and added on there, SEPA, which gives me a different perspective. For sure. When I'm looking at clients who have either recently purchased the business mm -hmm. or have sold and now I'm working with the new owner. Right. We forget, I think sometimes that they need to be able to recoup that cost of investment. So when they've purchased that business, did they do it through a bank or was it financed partly by the old ownership and they're paying it back over a period sure. of time? And some people do that as security, right? That's how I'm going to keep that previous owner sticking around. Right, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, but there's is- still that substantial investment that they need to recoup. Oh, and you had used that term five years. Right. And they can, yeah. lots of times businesses will, will drive that business right into the ground in an effort to try to recoup what they purchased and they lose all of the value that they purchased. Right. Yes, absolutely. So there's a couple of things on that front. First of all, we always cross-check the, the, the valuation. Uh, and again, this is something that that someone who values it for a, let's say a divorce settlement or probably is not going to bother because they're, they're coming up with that economic value with a particular formula. When we value it, you know, we, we use a whole bunch of methods. We triangulate. And then the, the last check is always, okay, you know, given on the expected performance, can this be financed? Can, can a buyer come in and pay themselves a living wage again, particularly if it's someone who's coming in to to buy a job or or you know a job plus kind of, but they still they're going to be paying themselves. It's not purely a, an investment. They need you know cash flow from the business to feed their family. Can they afford that at a reasonable level and finance the debt? Right, because if 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 that's not viable, then the business won't sell. You can you know. Again, this is where it comes in with that difference of if I'm coming in and I'm just buying your your operation and I'm going to bolt it on to what I already have and I've already got, you know, benefit program and accounting and all the back end stuff, it's different. Um, I can probably weather six months of the business, not, you know, while we're transitioning, having that dip. But if I need to be feeding my family on the basis of this next month, it's it's got to be you know, I can't be paying top, top value for it. So that's one side of it. Um, yeah. And then having that understanding. So often the vendor take back will be a way for the, for the seller to get a premium. Um, they might want to sell it and we'll often have two prices with a cash only deal. Let's say it would be a million. If we do a vendor take back, maybe we get 1.3, right? Because there's a lot more flex you know, if, if the seller is still involved, I mean, obviously people don't want to have to, to, to prolong payouts or, or, or modify, but reality happens. And sometimes that the market might take a shift. And, and so the buyer is probably a bit more comfortable saying, I'm going to remain almost in partnership with, with the seller. Um, it incentivizes both parties to kind of work together and, and then it allows, you know, for more of a valuation because basically you're dropping the risk, right? So it always comes down to risk versus value, that that element. And I've read some statistics and I don't have them off the top of my head, but I've read statistics that sellers who who do put that kind of skin in the game have a higher chance of closing with a potential seller than those that are like, no, no, I just want my money so that they they can run away. And I think you (laughs) hit on a very key point there is it removes a lot of the risk. It removes that risk to say, you know, if it doesn't work right away, I have a resource. Now I have a consultant. I have somebody who is, is, is as invested in my making it by my first five years than not. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're bang on. So lenders tend to be more amenable, right? I mean, like, like uh, B- BDC or even the commercial banks. Now we, we have a couple of deals where, and for a long time, we always used to say commercial banks, you know, not in the game. They've, they've changed their, their approach, but when they're looking at, at at least a portion of, of seller carry or also known as uh, vendor take back, it, it increases their level of confidence because like, like you just put it, the seller's not just going to disappear into the night, you know, and like, good luck, <laughs> right? They're, they're sticking around, uh, increases the buyer's confidence, attracts more buyers, first of all, right? Because there are some buyers who will not even look at a business if there isn't at least a portion of that. Maybe they've gotten burned in the past and they're like, yep, nope. If uh, if the seller's not willing to, to demonstrate a little bit of confidence, uh, then I'm not interested, right? What What message is that sending me? And there's a benefit to the seller as well in that usually they can get a higher valuation. And typically, you know, there's an interest rate, maybe not as aggressive as the bank, but, you know, still reasonable. So even though their money might be delayed three years, they're going to get a little bump there. 
and um so it's a good way for again a win-win between between all the parties yeah a bit of an annuity if i use my my insurance yeah. terms in there it's there a bit you of go yeah. and the the other that strikes me as we're talking about this is it's a reassurance for any employees transitioning with the new buyer and for any clients who might be impacted, it is a, a smoother, in my opinion, a smoother transition than just saying, well, I have dealt with Bob or Jane for the last 20 years, and now they're just up and gone. Right. In my world, I am usually able to get business because clients will, will have their trust shattered. Mm -hmm. And you will say, well, I was dealing with so-and-so, but then they just up and sold their business. And here I was dealing with somebody brand new and now I'm uncomfortable. If I have to deal with somebody brand new, I want to choose who that brand new is. Absolutely. And so well, I would highly encourage the seller to stay involved because it helps the buyer transition and retain. Yeah, yeah. So that actually brings to light two, two, two factors. Uh, the first was confidentiality. And the second is control of the narrative, right? So confidentiality is, is super important. Uh, in fact, it's like the number one thing for us as brokers, like all of our buyers, uh, they don't get uh, to see anything until they've signed a, a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and then it's sort of a, a, a stepped process. So there's a level one, where they get to see very minimal information. They never get to find out who the business is or where they're located. We play different games. If it's if it's something like an auto repair shop, Edmonton, we'll identify Edmonton. Like how many, you know, like good luck guessing which one. But I've had a business like in a, in a rural part where there's only about three businesses that do that. So if you identify it as that particular municipality, eh, so we'll call it like Northern Alberta, right? Once a buyer enters our process and then shows us proof of funds, so usually we want to see liquidity, you know, for the down payment. And again, that eliminates a whole bunch of those from the 100 to 2%, like about half of them disappear when you say, you know, show me the money. <laughs> then we will show them a little bit more information. Again, everything is kept confidential. There's no identifiers. They usually get to see a, a more of a detailed financial report. At that point, if they're still interested, we would then go to our seller, have a conversation, introduce them who the buyer is, you know, and are they willing to basically meet with them? And at that point, we would then introduce, you know, obviously, if we're going to physically visit, they got to find out who the business is. But we'll do that usually after hours. And, and you know, we're very strict. If a potential person shows up out of the blue at the business, usually we, that's it. They're done. And I were really strict with our sellers too. Like, do not tell anybody other than perhaps your accountant, you know, people who are are also under uh, confidentiality, right? But don't don't leave stuff lying around. Um, if you have to share with a trusted member of the staff, let's say maybe the office manager at some point in the process, but you want to control that process so that the staff find out at the right time in the right way. And that could be, again, depending on the level of, of seniority, like I say, let's say a, a, an office manager, a CFO probably wants to meet the potential buyer and work with them earlier. But the person who's working in, in the, let's say, shipping and receiving, not that I don't want to value their, their, their contribution, but they're not as critical to know who the new boss is going to be, right? They, they, they're probably fine to be introduced after it's already a done deal and their questions are going to be, you know, am I, am I being let go? You know, where's the business going and, and so forth and so on. So it's, it's a really deliberate process of when do we let, and same thing with vendors, right? Um, you want to have them have that and, and, and clients, right? The more it's all about confidence. So we say manage the process. And then on the other side, often we will recommend to a buyer strongly and make them, promise that they will not materially change the operation for at least a year. We don't want someone coming in and, and being like, I know better. And, uh, um, you know, we're going to change this and change that. Yeah. Okay. After you've run the business for a year, uh, particularly if it's profitable, it's different. If it's a, if it's a financial, uh, um, uh, strategic buyer, that's different, right? Cause the, their purpose is different, but if it's a, a regular buyer, in fact, ish, 
jokes around, you know, if the, if the owner puts a pencil behind his left ear, you should put a pencil behind your left ear for a year. Like you don't change anything. You learn, you, you emulate, you go through the process, you let the people do what they know how to do and sort of certain uh, degree of, I guess, uh, humility, right? Uh, which again, we try to gauge when we're working with a buyer, is this someone who's going to come in and start throwing elbows around because we'll tell them it, it, that's not going to work. Right. And, and I wish from my point of view, more people listen to you. <laughs> right. And then the seller's looking at it too. They may not want to do a, a, a seller carry to a buyer that they think is going to just come in and, and, and set the whole place on fire. Right. For usually for two reasons, a, Often they value their employees and those relationships and their customers. So they want a buyer that they think is going to honor that. Um, and if they're going to be part of the, you know, the finance, extending financing, they don't want a loose cannon that's going to just, you know, like you said, drive the business into the ground. There's no, there's no purpose in that. So part of what we do is that dance. Now, obviously you can never have a crystal ball that that predicts perfection, but the more we can, raise those issues and, and kind of poke and probe and ask the questions, you know, why do you want to buy? Why do you want to sell? The better off we can get to a fit. We'll close it there until next time. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, thanks for, for putting it together, Lori. It was, uh, yeah, it went by super quick. It was enjoyable. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we provided some value here. I, I kind of think so. Oh, you definitely did. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>